everyone. Uh, welcome to our next episode of Tying with the Pros. We're here today with Ricky Evans. Uh, Ricky is a deer hair machine. Uh, anyone who has spent any sort of time uh, fishing gear for bass is familiar with the Zara Spook uh, Walk the Dog uh, lures. Ricky ties our deer hair Fido pattern that we offer at Muskie Town. Uh, this pattern originated in the fly fishing world from Jeff Kramer, and Ricky ties more of these than anybody else. So without getting too long-winded at this point in the video, let's go ahead and uh, kick it over to Ricky. And, and Ricky, yeah, what do you got going on today? Oh, well, like you said, we're going to tie the, the deer hair Fido. Um, a quick materials list would be uh, this would be the the larger version. It's a 80 millimeters chocolate big game shank. Um, got some 3 16 tungsten beads and a three aught gumakatsu octopus hook. Some eyes. I, I put eight millimeter eyes on them. Um, you can go bigger or smaller. It's totally up to you. Um, I got 200 denier GSP, of course, a pile of deer hair to play with, and we'll get started. Some glue, got to have some glue. <laughs> what kind of glue do you like? Uh, I, I use super glue on, on just put, put a drop of super glue on the thread base, but you can use liquid fusion, uh, Fly right makes something called fly tight that works well on deer hair bugs, but uh, super glue's uh, what I use on them because it's readily available for me and uh, it's fairly cheap. And you tie fast enough not to not to pay for it. Um, for anyone who's just getting into deer hair work, uh, super glue gets a little it, it's pretty fast to work with unless you're really proficient and you feel like you're pretty quick getting your, your deer hair spun or stacked and, and packed uh, a lot of times uh, that that super glue will set up before you get a chance to pack everything tight. So uh, part of why that works for Ricky is because he does tie as fast as he does. So if you look on your, your big game shank, you have uh, one side's got a bigger eye than the other. Okay. You're going to put your hook and your rear bead on, of course, on the, the bigger eye on the bigger end. When you get all that on there, if you're willing to show us what that looks like up close, that'd be awesome. Absolutely. Absolutely. <clears throat> Don't see that. That looks great. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to put that in a vise. And I, I uh, clamp it in my vise, you know, between the hook and the bead. And the hook sits on top. And I think you said what size you were using, but I, I, I missed it. What size uh, octopus hook is that? The three aught, the three aught with the eighty millimeter. Cool. Go, you can use a two aught or a four aught. I wouldn't go that much difference. I mean, the four aught's a pretty big hook on it, and a two aught's somewhat small. Three aught seems to be the the, the magic number. Um, okay, so I'm gonna put a drop of super glue right in front of the bead on the shank here. And attach my uh, my thread. You really need this glue there because the GSP is going to slip if you don't glue it down. A lot of people will wrap the entire shank with thread. I won't do that. There's no need for it, in my opinion. Um, it's really just a waste of thread. Um, so we're attached and uh, we are tying the my my version of a yellow perch, and um, which is going to consist of about four colors and some deer hair mixing and things of that nature. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and say I believe in, in Mr. Cohen's book. The pattern calls for a three sixteenths and a five sixteenths bead, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, it says five sixteenths under the hook. I mean, yeah, five no, three sixteenths under the hook, and five sixteenths in the belly. In Cohen's book, he also uh, recommends you attach the bead to the shank via mono, tie it in, tie it on and everything before you start stacking hair. I don't do this. I will embed the bead in the belly when I'm finished. And reason being is because it, with that bead on the shank, tied on the shank, it, it makes it way more difficult to stack hair around it. 
And if you're not absolutely perfect with what you're doing, your patterns will get off, you know, because you have to fill the gaps, especially on the back side of the bead in order to get it packed. And plus during packing, I also feel like you take a chance of pushing the bead back, slipping it out of place, if that makes sense. So yeah. I don't do that. I actually just embed it in the belly uh, when I finish trimming the fly. So, yeah, I think that's good intel. I mean, I'll, I'll add just a little bit of context there just because I haven't tied this exact pattern from you, but um, we've done some minks in the past that are tied on a pretty comparable platform. They use the same uh, weights to get it to sit in the water with that, you know, kind of upward facing tilt for the walk. Um, but aside from there being a couple different ways to do things in the event that you say you only have a 3 16 inch bead, um, if you do choose to go with a, a larger hook in the rear, that, that four out hook, that seems to also walk uh, in well. So it really is just about the amount of weight and the orientation in the water for before you start. A absolutely. It's, it's really, it has to do, you can, you can actually change the size of these beads and the fly will still function. The, the, like, but like with the original lure, the actual spook lure, the concept is just to have the rear, the rear weighted heavier than the front. That way it tends to want to outrun the front on the strip or the, the, the jerk, the pop, whatever. Um, that's the concept behind it. So you have a bigger head and a tapered tail. So there's less resistance on the tail from the water, more resistance against the head and the tail is, is weighted more. So it tends to want to make the rear of the fly want to outrun the front. So that's how you get that side to side kick. Same same concept as the lure. Same exact concept as the lure itself. So we'll go ahead and get started on this. Um, on this fly, if you're going to be putting a pattern in it, like we're going to be doing here, <clears throat> um, you're going to want to put just your top and your bottom color first. And the reason being is because if you stack a bunch of colors right here, right off the bat, you're gonna be trimming close to the shank at the end down here, at the tail of the fly. And if you got three or four colors stacked on top here, when you go to trimming down close to the shank, you take a really good chance of cutting your thread. Because you your can't get it as, because you can't get it quite as tight to the shank as you can with that single bundle, right? So the first thing that I'll do is I'll put two decent clumps here of just the top and the bottom color, which is going to be white and yellow. So get you a good clump of deer hair and uh, brush it out. And you always want to brush out your deer hair. Get all the under fur and short hairs out. Always. Trim your tips. And hold it down at an angle, say on about a 45 on your side of the hook. Throw one loose wrap, two loose wraps, and on your third time, roll it all the way over to the bottom. I'm pressing my wrap, my thraps, my wraps with my thumb, and I'm supporting the shank here with this finger. Keep from pulling the shank down and pull down tight. And for anyone who can't see, just because we're not zoomed in on, on Ricky's shank there, there's a bare spot on the top of the shank. He's using his thumb there to leave room so that that next top color has space. Right. Okay. Now I'm going to take my yellow and just, like I said, these are these are fairly large clumps of hair. About yeah, as much use as the I pencil example, what would you say you're doing on the bottom versus on the top? Um. On, on these two clumps, I'm basically uh, about the same size, same amount of hair. Um, when I get to the, uh, the pattern, which would be a, a ring and a spot, there's going to be a little more on top than there is on the bottom. But this is about, well, like, like I said, it's about as much as I can handle in my hand without losing it. A couple, couple um, pencils or so? Yeah, a couple of pencils would be be a, a, a legit way to say it. Cool. It and you're... Like... Sorry, go so ahead. It, <laughs> it feels like holding a pen in your hand if you squeezed it tight. Cool. 
Um, and I, I noticed you doing one thing right there and I just wanted to go ahead and do it. I'll just draw attention and give a little extra color. Um, when you notice in a lot of our other deer hair videos, um, poppers or divers, anything that has that rear, uh, rear collar, you'll notice that we leave the ends on, um, this pattern is, is tied a little bit differently where in the rear, it almost looks like a cigar. So you don't really need those, uh, those ends of the deer hair. So that's why Ricky's right. trimming those off. Right. Absolutely. Um, um, okay. Let me, let me go back over here. Okay. So I set my 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 yellow on top of the hook i mean on top of the shank and i go one wrap two wraps then i'm gonna pick my thumb and press down on my wraps and support this shank here and pull straight down and i'm gonna go one more wrap same thing pull straight down and a lot of people ask me how much tension am i using and i'm I'm using 200 denier gsp and i'm putting as much tension as i feel safe to put on this deer hair without cutting through it and you've probably broken it pulling a little extra hard at some point, right? Uh, yeah, I've, I've been known to snap snap it. It happens to everyone while you figure out the sweet spot, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm pulling this deer hair back. And I'm going to work my thread through it. Out in front of it. And then I'm going to run my bobbin up to the base of the deer hair. I don't know if you can see that or not. I run my bobbin all the way up. And I'm going to put three or four good wraps right at the base of, of that deer hair, okay? And I, I use a, a pin, just a gutted pin, okay? I'm going to use the big end, and I'm going to throw a half hitch on this. And, I'll, and then until I get past the center of this fly, let's see if I can show you guys this. So I've got, got my thread, and I'm going to throw a half hitch in it, okay? And I'm going to pull this, this thread out of the way to keep it from hanging up on the back back side of that shank. And then I'm gonna pull my half hitch tight. Does that make sense? It does. If, if you throw a half hitch like this, you take a chance of, of catching your thread on the bottom end of this uh, shank and it can cut your thread. Probably helps keep it out of the way of your hair too, right? Right, yeah, it, it'll push it right up to the base of your hair and it pushes your hair back, so. Uh, so that's a good point using that longer shank. Yeah. Um, so got my half itch. I'm going to take my packer and just pack it back tight. Then I'm going to run my bobbin back up. I'm going to put three or four wraps on top of that and advance my thread forward three or four wraps. And while, uh, while Ricky's doing it, I just want to draw attention to something here. So uh, in terms of tools that we use we're pretty fortunate now um we've got the fugly packer and that's what he just used to to push his, his his to compress that deer hair and get it as tight as possible for this pattern but um back in the day uh you know we'd use tools like this is really the equivalent of a pen with a ball on it to try to get extra um you're welcome to try it that way it uh it, it's doable you'll still be able to get some pretty tight patterns but really there's nothing that works as well as that fugly packer to get deer hair tight yeah. Yeah, especially on the pattern. I actually only use the fugly for this fly. I have uh, some custom made packers that a guy, a guy here in Texas made for me. It's called the Pro Packer. And it's a it's a really, really great tool. But um as far as this big spook goes for the deer hair fido, it it uh that fugly is is the way to go for sure. Cause you can really bear down on that 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 fugly packer and it's it's gonna do its job. It, you're right, it it is an excellent tool. It really is. Do you, do so you use I'm, the large one or the small one? Do you have a preference? Uh, I I don't have a small one. I just have the, the large one. I've honestly never used the small one. So, but um, I like the way that this this other packer it's smaller and it fits my hand better. So, on it, just about any other bug I tie, I use it. So, anyways, I've I've, I've advanced my thread forward and I'm just going to put a drop of glue on those thread wraps and at the base of that hair. Okay. Now we're going to go back to the white. Now, when you're picking deer hair, uh, how long do you, do you need your hair to be, you know, two inches long or you just, as long as you got good, consistent, you know, one, one and a half inch hair, you're pretty happy usually. 
Uh, I like it, you know, the longer the better, in my opinion. It just makes it easier to handle. So, um, but this is probably two, two inches here. Nice. Two and a half, quarter maybe. But, um, yeah. So now we're just going to repeat the process of the first time with the white. We're going to set it kind of at an angle on each side of the hook. One wrap, two wrap, and then on your third time, you're going to roll it all the way to the bottom. So one more wrap, tighten down. This is where we're going to put a start the pattern. So we're not going to use a whole bunch of yellow on this because you got to add three other or three different patterns, three different colors. Sorry. Yeah. And while Ricky's cutting out, what he's saying is so when you're stacking deer hair, say you did use two pencils on the bottom of that white clump, you're going to want maybe a little more than two pencils with the hair on the top. And if you grab, you know, two pencils of that first color when you're stacking, you're going to end up with so much hair in there. It's going to be hard to get your, your thread tight enough to get it to the shank. So, you know, how many, uh, how many sections are you going to be stacking in the top there? Uh, three. So as, uh, as you're, you know, learning with deer hair and starting, especially if you want to pre cut out your, your top sections and or top bundles. So you know that you've got, you know, two and a half pencils worth of hair for the top and two pencils worth of hair for the bottom total. Um, I I've seen folks do that with success as you get a little more comfortable knowing how much hair to use you know, you don't really need to do it. Uh, but just at least starting off, it keeps you so that your patterns are uh, stacked relatively evenly. The con consistent stacks. Okay, so I've got my my little piece of yellow down. I've got two wraps. And I'm going to press down on my wraps and pull straight down. And then go one more time. Press down, pull straight down. Okay. On this particular fly, I... Uh, It'll have a ring and a spot in that too. So I'm the the ring I make with the uh, gray and green, and this is a good way to show you how to easy good way to show you an easy way to mix colors. So uh, I've got just a little pinch of gray. And I'm going to put that in my hair stacker. While you're doing that, what vice are you tying there? Tying with there? That's the peak, peak rotary. Peak rotary. Do you have any? Uh, do you have saltwater jaws on that, or just the the standard? Just the standard. How uh, yeah. how big of hooks do you find that uh, to hold for you? I can hold all the way up to three, four, five lot hooks with it. Yeah, it does. It does pretty good. It's good for the price, anyway. Yeah, it's sure. definitely a good budget, uh, good value. I don't like the term budget. It's a good value vice. Agreed. Yeah. yeah. I haven't tied with one. So, you know, those little, you know, what's the biggest hook you've managed to get in there is usually a, a good question. Yeah, I, I put five watt in it. Nice. Five watt bass hook, you know, Kona's, uh, Gamma, B10s, it'll hold them. You just got to set them further back in the jaws to make sure it gets a good grip. So I'll put my two colors in my vice, my green, I mean, in my stacker, uh, green and gray, and uh, just kind of stack them down. And I'm going to take my, my, my bodkin or W needle, whatever, and I'm going to stick it down in my uh, stacker. And I'm just going to mix these hairs around, get them good and blended together. And that, for me, this is the easiest way to, to blend colors. Um, it keeps you from losing a lot of the hair. And so you're just stirring with that bodkin, huh? Mm -hmm. I I love that. <laughs> I, I struggle so much blending hair. Yeah. You just reach in there and just stir it around real good. It's going to want to come out of the top. You just, you know, if you drop some, that's okay. But it's a lot easier than, than, than doing it in your hands. You know, you're not going to lose near as much this way. Okay. And then I'll stack it. Get the ends as even as I can. So now I've got a, a, a pretty good blended of gray and green there. And when doing that, if you can select a hair that is pretty straight and of the same consistency, and what I mean by that is like the texture of the hair. Some hair you get is going to feel smoother. Some's going to feel real spongy. Some's going to be feel real coarse. 
So if you can get two, two, two of the same textured hair and make sure it's as straight as possible instead of having any kind of a big curve in it or anything, it'll, it'll mix a lot better. That's specifically for when you're blending. Like if you were using a single color, you wouldn't be as worried about it. Right. Right. Yeah. It's no big deal that way. It just, well, mixing it that way with the stacker, that's, that's what you're going to want to go for. So here's the butts after I've stacked the ends and everything mixed it. I'm just going to trim them off somewhat even. And then flip it in my hand. And trim the tips off. Okay. So I'll take that, that, that patch of yellow I just tied in. I'm going to take and kind of just basically make a funnel out of it to where my thread wraps are and just kind of flat. This directly on top of that. And I'm going to go. One wrap, two wraps. And on every stack you do, go two wraps first, okay, before you cinch it down. That's that's a given on, on any stack of hair you put in. Okay. This on this one, I'm going to pinch the entire stack of hair and pull straight down. And what that's going to do is it's going to bring all those hairs together. And that's basically the way you make a ring or a spot. You don't have to do that. You can still make, you know, spots and rings without, by just pressing it in the center and pulling it down. But it, it'll it'll make a more oblong, if that makes sense. More of an you're oval. Controlling the shape of of what you're doing in the stack there. Yes. Yes. Awesome. Okay. So after that, you go one more wrap and pinch it again and just pull straight down. That kind of just sets everything. And now you're I'm going to take and make another. Go ahead. Oh, no, you're good. Keep going. I'm going to cut you off. Uh, now I'm going to take and make another funnel. So basically just kind of taking my finger and, and opening up the center of that, that stack. Awesome. And then I'm going to take uh, my black. I'm just going to cut a little pinch out of this. So How many, how many uh, clumps do you end up getting on an 80 millimeter shank? Oh. <laughs> a bunch? <laughs> yeah. In, in probably pushing close to i don't know mid 20s mid 20s i would think depending on how many colors i got to put on it so i'm, I'm sorry i asked clumps how many sections then uh talking about just uh, as far as sections you mean top and bottom stacks full stack not. full stacks yeah 12 probably okay cool uh, I'm just guessing. I don't know. Maybe maybe a few more. I'll, I'll try to fill it up as quickly as I can. Okay. So I got my black and I've I've got my my green kind of flared out to where it makes a little funnel in the top there. I'm gonna lay this black right inside of it. I'm gonna go one wrap, two wraps. And I'm gonna pinch that black and pull straight down. When it, when I'm pinching it, I'm pinching it at my my thread wraps. So I'm pinching the thread wraps and the hair at the same time, pinching it together, pulling straight down. I'm gonna You're go keeping one that more. hair centered on the top, right? Yes, sir, the best I can, yes, sir. And you can actually adjust it, move it around a little bit before you pack it back. And I'm gonna, one more wrap, and I'm gonna pinch it, pull it straight down again. Okay, now I'm gonna reach up here and I'm gonna pull all this hair back. And me, I'll take and I'll just go ahead and slide it back with my hand. And that kind of helps you get everything back out of the way the way you want it. I'm gonna work my thread, right. I'm gonna work my thread through the same as on the first couple of stacks. I'll run my bobbin up and go three or four wraps at the base. And I'm gonna half hitch it off. Got my half hitch. I'm gonna pack it back. I recommend you tie this with a with a C clamp style vise, something you can actually attach it to a desk. And the reason being is because I'm actually using this hand to sturdy my uh, packer. And what I'm doing is I'm trying to keep my packer because I'm pushing really hard, a lot harder than most people would think. It's you know 30, 30 pounds, forty pounds of pressure. I always like to say I could lay a a forty pound bag of dog food on a tailgate and push it in with one hand push it up into the back of the truck and slide it across the tailgate. That's about as much pressure as I'm putting on this. So if that gives people an idea of how, how hot tight we actually pack these flies. Yeah. Yeah. I, 
I do want to add just one thing, just because I know that a lot of our viewers won't necessarily have a C-clamp. That doesn't exclude you from tying this pattern, but if you do have a pedestal and you're going to be tying, you know, this fly, you're going to want to make sure that, you know, when you grab onto everything before you pack, you're holding tight because, you know, to Ricky's point, you're using a lot of pressure there. And, and the reason that uh, I recommend you have a C-clamp is because you don't have to worry about stabilizing your vice. It's, it's there. What you, what you can focus on is keeping the packer from going this way, this way, this way, this way. And you bend in your shank, you pushing the fly out of the vice because this fly, these, I mean, there's really not a vice out there that's, that will securely hold this shank. I don't know of one that exists. You know, I just, I, it's that simple. It's just a lot of leverage. And especially when you get out here closer to the end, it's just going to be so easy to slip and push and then the whole thing come up or you bend the shank whatnot so but yeah you can't you can do it with a pedestal but like like you say it's you got to be careful you'll you'll bend and mess things up so anyways i got it packed back i'm gonna put three or four more wraps yeah to your point ricky on how much pressure you're using there like i've actually bent uh b10s hooks tying mm -hmm. doing deer hair work so i mean you really you're using quite a bit and that's part of why you're supporting it with that offhand yes sir yes sir yeah. okay, i got my my thread advanced forward and i'm gonna put another drop of glue there this is the part where i will put uh kind of like on a yellow perch you know they have the orange fins and so this is where i will put some orange in the belly of the fly and it's it's simple so i'll just grab two decent sized clumps of um, white and orange. And you can go just straight orange if you wanted to, but I like blending some white in with it because it kind of gives that, I don't know, I just like the way it looks better. It's really a preference, I guess, but. While you're tying that, actually I'm looking at one of your flies. I'm gonna go ahead and grab it so that folks can see what it is you're tying there. Okay. And this is a, just such a cool pattern. Um, you know, I remember especially getting into deer hair, you know, starting to say, hey, okay, what, how did this operate? You know, what is this compared to, you know, a lure? And this is what Ricky's talking about, uh, just like in blending that orange for those fins. And this is, you know, of course, trimmed, but, uh, you know, it's that upward shape hooked. Anyway, really cool fly. You can see where the counterweight ends up being at the end. Um, I'm going to go ahead and guess that Ricky uses a cauterizer tool to, uh, yes, I'm there. I do, but I'm not going to do it on this one. Uh, I typically take that outside because I don't like getting the smell of burnt hair throughout my house. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but I will just, uh, do just cut a hole in the belly with a pair of scissors, the tips of my scissors. And, um, just to show you, but yes, I do use a uh, wood burning pen most of the time makes it a little bit cleaner hole so I've, I've just mixed my orange and white together it's a pretty rough mix right you're not working to make you 100 percent sure that everything's blended perfectly or anything like right it, it's you know just just make it work for you um in the end, the fish aren't going to care. They're, they're really not. You know, a lot of people are OCD or perfectionists about this thing, and they worry about one stray hair and whatnot. But in, in the end, you know, the fish that are going to eat these things, they don't care. Bass, pike, musky, you know, they're mean. They, and they, they could care less about that one hair. <laughs> you know? But um, right, so I got my, my fin in. And, uh, I usually do this right after the first set of uh, pattern stacks. And then I'll apply another one of these orange and white mixed about three quarters of the way up. And I would consider this more of a, a bass pike fly than a, a musky fly. I'm sure that, you know, there would be bycatch situations, but, you know, yeah. this size profile really is something that caters well to, to bass and pike, especially in the perch yeah. for pike. Right. So what I'm doing is I'm not, I'm putting another clump of 
uh, just just straight yellow here on top of this. And, and the reason I'm doing this is to, it, it separates the uh, spots it, instead of blending them together. If I was to just put yellow and then more spots, they would just all blend together. So uh, I'm basically just putting a, a yellow. This typically would be white, but it's it's the orange pen. But I'm just spacing out the spots. So I'm going to put another clump of yellow, tie that off, and repeat from there until I feel the shank of it. So. And the effect of that, just so folks can see again, because we have the one right here. Right. You end, you end up with these spots that are nice and even space, you know, like a perch stripe. Right. If I didn't put this spacer yellow in here, all those spots would have just blended together. Which is nothing wrong with that. It would still make a nice pattern, I'm sure. I guess it's really in what, what you want, what you're going for. And when you when you tie your clumps in, it's always the same process. Run your bobbin up close, two or three, four wraps at the base of the deer hair, and half hitch it off. Same process after each each time you tie in your bottom and your top stacks. And you're gonna pack it back. Three or four more wraps, advance your thread forward. As far as fishing these things, um, there's two ways you can work them. Of course, you can just pop the rod, you know, like you would the, the, the actual lure when you're fishing conventional gear. You know, you could just pop the rod. Or the best way I've found, of course, is, of course, use a loop knot. That's less resistance. But hold your rod tip right at the, right at the water, point, of course, pointed at the fly. And, um, you know, short, sharp strips. And it, it should walk walk for you, no problem. You know, you it's kind of a, a little bit something to get used to, especially when you're not used used to trying to fish a fly that way. It's a skill fly, right? Like it's got a particular. You'll get that rhythm, and it'll swim right. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yep. And uh, you, once you figure it out, you're like, oh wow, cool. This thing's neat. You know. And there's, you know, it's just a fun fly to fish. It, it really is because there's not too many flies out there that will give you that kind of an action. Yeah, you've got flies loaded with marabou that, that that dance beautifully in the water because of the movement that marabou has. And then there are several streamers out there that you can actually make walk the dog underwater. They loop left and right as you as you you know, and it's like the game changer fly too. It's there's not a lot of flies on a list out there that that have great action. Most of them are just straightforward strip strip or pop, you know. Yeah, yeah. I'll say the uh, the the skill that you're describing. Uh timing those strips and pops to get that top water fly to walk like you're trying to do um, yeah. that actually is a very similar skill to stripping some of those streamer patterns that that walk back and forth you know uh, our mechanical bull and, and rodeo clown uh plus a couple of our gliders really come to mind like that and and when you do when you're in the zone and you're fishing those and you're twitching that rod tip you know on that slightly slack line as it tightens you know and you get that walk and you find that rhythm um you know it, it, there's similarities and their differences the skill to get them to walk is the same but um when you're fishing for a species let's let's use musky as the example because they're notorious for being picky um if you're swimming your fly in a rhythm uh, you're going to get a lot of follows. You may not necessarily get a lot of eats. Uh, bass are a little bit different in that regard where you kind of, that rhythm isn't going to hurt you. Um, but you will notice even with bass that, you know, you may be using that rhythm and then you stop that fly for a second and it just gets slammed. Um, so, you know, there's a fine line between that rhythm and that skill of swimming these and being just erratic enough to trigger something to eat. Yeah, absolutely. Or there's that they they're following it, you know, and then you stop it and then they sit there and stare at it and then you twitch it. And that's that's all it takes. Now, I wanted to say something about these shanks. If you look at the shank. This is kind of important, and this is this is going to be one of the most difficult parts of tying this fly is there is a gap. Between the tip here and the tip here. Can you rotate so, it a little bit so it's easier? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so 
there's a small gap, say almost a quarter inch between the tip, the two, the two ends of the wire. When you get close to that, you're going to want to try to make sure your hair is stacked as close to the edge as to there as possible because you're not going to be able to tie in a stack of hair in between the, the ends on just that single wire and pack it back over the top of that, that end. So you're going to want to fill up as much as that as you can to, to when you get to the edge of it. So while you've got that bear shank right there, if you're putting that last section before the, the cliff, we'll call it, before that step in the wire, where's your next section start? Uh, I will tie it in between the two, to two, the two ends. So your point there is that you're just, if you were to try and compress that back, because I've, I've broken my thread there. Um, yeah. Your point is the, the edges of those shanks, no matter how nice, you know, those big game shanks are, or if you make your own, um, you, you compromise, even with GSP, clipping that thread and, and breaking it. So Ricky's mm -hmm. point there is if you're too far back from that step, you're not going to be able to get that nice, tight, consistent, solid look out of your hair. Absolutely. That's exactly what I was trying to say. <laughs> no, I like the, the way you did that. The visual of that was really helpful. Um, I, I even, you know, someone who's worked with deer hair a reasonable amount, uh, even if I am slow with it, um, I've learned a lot of these lessons the hard way. And, you know, anytime you can help someone to not have to do the same is a good thing. this last stack of hair on here and me i take in uh i'll do about seven or eight good tight half hitches uh there's a lot of guys out there that will take and go one two three four around their pin and this does work and then you rotate the pin toward yourself and that should bring all that up and makes one big whip finish you know i i don't do that very and i'll get thirds to do it just for the heck of it but i don't do that very often i just go you know several good tight half pitches on the end to finish the fly and, and alternatively and this is this is for our, our audience alternatively you know you'll notice it and when we did the video with derek last time that he uses the plastic trick you have a little square of plastic you cut a slit in it and it you know it'll let you help hold that hair back so you know some folks do like to do a whip finish and if you've got that plastic in the way it gets all those fibers out of the way and lets you do it there again this is personal preference and you're probably going to yeah. glue the heck out of it anyway so well you know once you get all them uh half pitches packed back in there that hair is going to hold it all down anyway i've done all, i do all of my bugs that way and have been doing them that way for a long time and i've never had <laughs> sure from all that hair wanting to push off the end locks that knot yeah. in tight yeah, yeah. Hold them tight. Yeah. Great point. So here's one of those tips that I do. And uh, we were talking about earlier. 
is I've cut, took a piece of plastic. Can you, I don't know if you see that. And I've cut us basically as close to a perfect circle as I can. And that's about the size of a nickel. Maybe a little smaller than a nickel. Well, I'll tell you what, it is smaller than a nickel. Here's a penny. So that's, yeah, it's about the size of a penny. So, and what I've done is after I cut my circle out, I, had, I heated up a shank and I slid this over as center as I could get it. I heated up the eye of the shank and I slid this over it, you know, melted the shank through it in the center. And what I'll do is I'll just pop this on the eye of the shank. Okay. And that's my trimming template. So I'll pop that on there and I'll take my razor blade and just a, a double edged. I assume you use a, a new razor per fly. Yeah. And uh, I, I, uh, but might have to go to use two of them on this one before I'm done. Okay. We'll see how last. So anyways, I got my little, my template. Let me, uh, so I basically just pop, popped my template on the front of my fly. And that's what I'm going to uh, go for. Now, when trimming these, don't get in a hurry and don't, don't think you have to make your exact cut perfect the first time. You know what I'm saying? Just take a little off at a time if you need to, which is perfectly fine. And try not to touch anything metal with your razor blade or you'll dull it. If you if you touch your hook or if you touch your vise, which I just did, we're fixing to see if I run it or not. Um, uh, don't tell you if you if you do this, you'll you'll put a dull spot in your razor blade and you'll see lines in your bodies. Yeah, I would automatically here just after touching the vise. I would yeah. automatically just switch razors and just they're cheap enough that there's no need to really yeah, push. See, you see there I, where I touched the vice now. I don't know if you can yeah, see it. It's a wee, it's a yeah. spot in the razor. There's a line there. So around here we go. <laughs> go ahead, using this side and just kind of get going and then I'll I'll flip it over and so but I usually start on the bottom and uh One of the themes we've talked about in, in trimming deer, deer hair is starting, especially when you're first carving the shape, uh, sculpting, I think is the right word, uh, operating in simple shapes. So I like the template that you're using and that you're operating in straight lines right now. You're kind of trimming a rounded rectangle, right? No, a circle. Well, I'm saying though, until you've done the circle, yeah. like those first few blades. Awesome. Right. I'll do the top, the bottom, and the sides after that. So and yeah, I'm to round it from there. Yep. So sure. on, okay, go ahead and explain this here. On the bottom, I try to trim back evenly as much as I can until right when I get to the bead. So once I can see the bead exposed, I don't try not to take any more off of the fly, off the bottom. And the reason being is because I still got to embed a bead in the belly. And if you go take too much off, okay, uh, you, you embed the bead in the belly roughly one third up from the rear. So I will le legitimately, this, the shanks are three and an eighth inch long. I will take a ruler and measure out one inch from the rear and put a spot. And that's where I'll, I'll, I'll embed the bead. And I'm gonna just for the sake of illustrating, cause you have the in progress version here and I'm holding the, the completed product. Um, I just want to show, so like you can see the bead right there. Uh, Ricky's point here is that he wants to make sure that there's enough hair that that bead is going to be able to embed down flush. If you go down deeper than that, trimming the hair, what's going to happen is you very much risk burning your thread and compromising the integrity of the stack where you're embedding that bead. That's exactly right. You know, and take take your time on trimming this, you know, because uh, with deer hair you can't go back. You know, and if you if you mess up now, all this time and materials that you put on this fly is basically wasted, and and you you're, it's run the fly's run. So don't dig in too deep. Take your time. See it. It's not perfect. It's got a big hump there. I'll take that down. While you're doing that, too, I want to explain why we try to use the sharpest blade we possibly can just for especially someone who's just getting into deer hair work or maybe you got five razor blades left and you don't want to waste them. Um, if 
your blade is dull, what will happen is as you go to trim that razor blade, you might get stuck in certain spots. So it's not just that you might end up with a high spot or that you can see that line when you're trimming. If you find yourself trying to shave and you are, by the end of it, you're almost sanding with that razor blade taking off so little hair. What'll happen is you can find yourself getting stuck. And then when you try to change your pressure to get past that stuck point, that's where problems happen. Yeah. So that's why you'll want to use a sharper blade. As soon as you notice that blade stop cutting well, um, it's, it's time to either flip the blade or change to a new one. Mm -hmm. yeah you don't want to uh dig in if you start hanging up that can cause you to slip and mess your fly up and one option we have here with this pattern and this is just again to the point of you know one of the recurring themes you notice in these videos we talk about variety in your fly box uh, being the spice of life having different options for different situations if if you wanted to make this, a, you know, more of a cigar popper rather than a um, rather than a, a walking fly like a deer hair phyto or, you know, some people call them spook flies. But um, if you wanted to make this a popper uh, in the last video, you'll notice one of the ways that you can finish that is use that same template like what Ricky did. And you'll put kind of a an intermediate layer of plastic, maybe from eyes. Um, and when you glue those and do it, you'd end up with that nice square popper face. Yep. Yes, sir. You can use a, I use a loon soft head on my poppers. Nice. And you, you can take the paper from your eyes or wax butcher paper or whatever, and you can put some loon on it and then put your, your, your paper from your eyes or your wax butcher paper over that and then put a little piece of plastic like this template, pop that over that and let that set. And that'll fill right off there. And then you got this flat surface. If, if you were doing that, would you leave the, uh, yeah, see, I love that. If, if you were doing that, if you were making this a popper instead of a, a deer hair Fido, would you, uh, would you leave your ends of your deer hair? Would you leave them rough or would you still probably go pretty tight? I, I think if I was to make a popper this way, I would probably put it some kind of a skirt or tail tied to the hook. Kind of like, kind of like the principle of a rebel popper. The actual, you know, the lure. Yeah. Just start, so, start hook, put some, put some flash and some, some hackle off the end of it, and still do it. This way. Yeah, yeah, something of that nature. Still do it this way. Well, I'm that far. I'm going to take and open. <laughs> so since we're not doing that, right? <laughs> just kind of evenly trim these up, and I can see. And then you can be able to see how much further you need to take down on the body here. And on the top, I like to go just down to the sh to where you can see the top of the eye of the shank, if that makes sense. So I gotta get yeah, I'll actually show the finished product here just again since we're close. But yeah, the, the loop of the rear of the shank is just exposed where these are done tr being trimmed. Now, this is a cool video. I, I think that people are going to be excited to see how you can make stuff like this, especially, you know, you come from a conventional gear background and yep. you know, hey, how do I, how do I do this? Well, there, there's a lot of ways, but this is, this is the way the guy who does it more than anyone else does it. Yeah. You know, and I just wanted to say a lot of people don't understand the amount of time that it does really take to do something like this. You know, when, if you're, if you're out there purchasing these flies, uh, you know that they're not cheap. I mean, there's roughly four or five bucks worth of hair put on one of them. You know, yeah. Yeah. the hooks, the hooks, especially on these hooks, they're, they're a dollar a piece. You know, you got two beads, your shank almost runs up just under a dollar a pop. You got ice, you got glue, you got thread. And then all, all your time and effort, you know, of tying one of these. So, you know, there's just no way someone could sell one of these for 10 bucks and get anywhere. Yeah. Not, not to mention the value of your experience tying them. Right. I mean, I, I think that we get in this world sometimes where people are like, well, you know, it took you an hour and I saw the materials that went on it. So, you know, I, I want to, 
I want to pay 15 bucks for a fly like this. And you laugh because it's like, well, what about the years that it took to get to that point? Like that's part of it. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, for the most part, people, you know, they don't bat an eye at them. You know, they, they want them, you know, and that's, you know, because they understand what it takes to make them, you know. Catch fish too. Yeah, it's a, it's a great pattern. Yeah, it, it catch fish. I put a lot of fish on them. And all I was doing there, guys, I was just trying to clean up the tail end the best I can, open up that that eye, just make it look a little better. All right. Now that I got more or less the shape I'm going for here. And at this point, you still have that template on the front? No, I just took it off. Cool. I'm going to shape the head now. Uh, do that free-handed. And all I do is I curve my blade and uh, just kind of get up the base of the hairs and just roll the head up. And, and you know, for anyone who can't see that, sorry, go ahead. And I'll I'll go back over each cut a couple of times to get it at the, at the angle I want and the clean as I want it. For anyone, who, do, go ahead. sorry, I've got a little internet delay there. Keep going. I'll, I'll wait. I do that on all four sides, kind of like I did when I started, and then I just start rounding it off the best I can, and get it looking as good as I can. Nice. All right, I'm probably going to cut you off again, but I'm jumping in. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, for anyone who you know, we we can't see quite all the way up close what Ricky's doing right now, but. Uh, when you're doing the trimming by the head on these flies, Ricky, while he has that curved blade, is leaning. I'm going to try if I can pull a razor out right here. He's leaning the flat part of that blade against the eye of the hook and using it as a bit of a guide while shaping. So, you know, this this is one of those razors just in the in the paper that it comes with. But if the tip of my finger is the guide, is the uh, eye of the hook, he's leaning it right up against the edge of there and then kind of trimming up and around that way you don't risk you know hitting the edge of your blade you you actually have kind of something to lean on while you do it is, is right. anything to add to that ricky no oh, yeah that's pretty much it and then you know you're just basically rounding rounding the nose off that's all you're doing it's such a cool fly yeah pretty neat i like to fish them so like I said, I took, I take a, uh, I literally take a, a ruler and a marker, a Sharpie marker or whatever. And I'll go ahead and one inch, one inch up from the rear bead. And it's just past that uh, orange spot. I'll put it on. Was, and if somebody was using a, Thank you. That's awesome. So if somebody was using a, you know, say you did a custom shank, you wanted to make your own and you said, you know what, I'm going to do a 150 millimeter shank, which is for funsies, we'll say um, your weight distribution is, what would you say? About a third, right? Third, a third. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's what Mr. Kramer told me. And the Mr. reason Kramer. for that, and the reason for that is, is if this is the water line and you've got that fly sitting in the water, if it sits like this, it might act like a diver. It might not do exactly what you're trying. So your goal is to have it sit just with the nose up so that, you know, if, if, if this is the fly sitting in the water, when you strip it, it does yeah. one of these. It kind of brings yeah. it down and dives and walks. Absolutely. Yep. And if you don't, if you can make these walk without that belly bead, I've done it. It's difficult. Definitely harder. The that 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 belly bead bead makes a big difference. It it really does. And um, but uh, just just rule of thumb to make to make one that you know is going to walk one third up of the, the entire length of the fly. That's, that's the best way to look at it. Um, that's just that's what Jeff told me. It'll be sure to dance the dance was word for word what he said. Dance the dance. <laughs> 
And he's right. It uh, it makes a world of difference. All right. I'll go ahead and just cut this out. Now, typically, like we discussed earlier, I'll use a burning pen, wood burning pen, and burn a hole in the belly where that dot is. Another thing that works well in that application is a, a cautery tool. It's something's got this specialized end. When you push the button, it heats up and it burns that hair. Right. I'm, but since I'm not going to take the time to go outside with this, I'm just going to do it with a pair of scissors. This is the tips of my scissors. I'm going to basically just cut a hole and to where I can recess the bead. But like, like, like you said, Adam, you got to be careful with that, that burning pin, burning a hole in one of these. You do not want to go too deep because you will mess a fly up real quick. That's a perfect example. <laughs> yeah, we've all, if you've tried this Saturn, you'll probably do it if you haven't. And you'll get a sense as you work more with deer hair, uh, you know, especially if you're newer intermediate deer hair tire, you'll get a sense for where your thread lays in relation to, uh, to the clump in the stack. Like you, you're going to generally know like, okay, I'm, I'm probably getting pretty close to thread right here. It's time to be careful. Um, yeah. yeah. Cause I just got a hole basically just took my scissors and chopped a hole in the belly. Perfect. And if you don't have a wood burning pan or whatnot, you can do it that way, or you can you can tie it in via mono before you ever start stacking. It's totally up to you. I really like the the whole whether you're using a burning tool or your scissors to clip it out. I really like that um, when you take your super glue and put it in the base of that hole, and then drop your bead in, and then a, you know epoxy over the top of it. Um, yeah. You know it's locked in there; it's not coming out not going to come out of there no and like you just said i'm going to take and put just a little drop of super glue in the bottom of that hole and i'm going to drop my bead in there and just press it down and hold it there for a sec and then get stuck yeah it's, <laughs> it's, i actually use a uv clear uv hard uv over you have a preference over. for thick or thin or any of the other options or what are your uh, I just use a, it's thin. I, I believe it's thin. I, I don't need it to be anything other than either I put it across the belly of the fly to help make it kill correctly on say a diver or a popper. I coat all my diver and popper bellies with a uh, clear hard UV resin. And um, this fill up, fill this hole up and you know, it, it makes a level level surface with the bottom of the fly. You, you know, you put it all in there. It'll make a pretty good, pretty good seal, and it, it's not going to let that bead go anywhere. So there's the bead down in the belly, and all I did was super glue it in, and then throw a, you know, a level piece, a level bit of of UV resin over it, hit it with a light. I started, and you'll like this. I don't think I, I, I don't think you've seen me do this yet, but I'll get to that in a minute. But I've been coating the bellies in liquid fusion yeah the fly the, the fly will work regardless with or without it but this but, is uh, great stuff I, i'll show folks just what you're dealing with this this liquid fusion stuff it, it's got a long working time it dries clear it's very strong uh, mm -hmm. really good stuff but now i'm going to put my eyes on and what i do with the eyes is i come to the front and i just bend my blade again and i i just cut a, a little notch about you know just a hair bigger than the eight millimeter eyes. And you could actually burn these in if you wanted to. I think that's a little excessive for putting a flat eye in here, you know, just a like predator eye or something. But I'll just cut two on one on each side where I want the eyes. I just groove it out, make like a little crater in the head of the fly. With so you're flexing blade. that blade pretty good right now to get that hole small, yeah. right? Yeah. And I just dig it out, shovel, shovel the hair out. Oh, awesome. So yeah, I mean, it has, it ends up having the same effect as burning out the eye. Right. I'll do that. Now on my eyes, I use, 
this stuff's awesome. I like using it. It works great. E6000. <laughs> <laughs> I laugh because this tires, especially the more you do it. I'm looking at about eight bottles of different super glues here. You'll, you'll play with all of them and you'll have a different reason for using them all in different places. Um, <laughs> that E6000 something else, especially on hair bugs. John, uh, John Cooper is uh, one of the guys that his name will come up a number of times and we're hoping to get some videos. Uh, hopefully we'll have already aired some videos of him tying. He swears by that E6000. The bottle's a little bit tricky to work with because, you know, more will come out than you want. And it's pretty stringy, but uh, it's one of those, it, it, it dries flexible. It has pretty good long working time. So, you know, especially if you're doing eyes over like laser dub or bruiser blend or, you know, uh, Titan dubbing, it, it bonds well. It kind of soaks into some of those materials like hair is a perfect example. You want that, that adhesive to soak in and bond to the hair and then also to the eye. But if you do it wrong, having the flexibility to pull the eye out for a second and redo it, wipe off the part that you don't want glue on. There's a lot of value to that. Yeah. Yeah, there really is. Mm -hmm. I was laughing so hard a second ago. This is to our audience. I was laughing so hard because I, I promise you, Ricky and I did not coordinate that. I just saw the bottle in his hand and recognized it. Yeah, it's good stuff. And you can get it at Walmart, the dollar store. Whatever, wherever you go, you can just swing by and pick it up at the grocery store. Most of them, most of them anyway, <laughs> and it, it works great. So there, the eyes are on, everything's done. And all I'm going to do now is coat the entire belly with a uh, liquid fusion. And this will make the fly slide in the water better, uh, more durable, you know, this and that, but uh, I just put a pretty good, a generous, generous line down the entire fly. And I like to take uh, and run it up over the eyes too and put a glob over the eyes. And that will actually, if you have any kind of a smudge or anything on the eye that you can see that stand, that's standing out to you, that will actually clean it up and make it look like it's never been there. You know, if you accidentally get a little bit of E6000 on it and it makes a little smudge, that will actually smoothen it out. And it'll actually hold them eyes on better for you too. Yeah, you know, the, the first time I, I saw the, uh, the liquid fusion, the, I, I believe it was when, uh, Matt Zudwig did his, uh, he did a cicada pattern for the uh, brood X hatch. Um, and, and I guess the point of the whole story is that the liquid fusion dries clear and flexible, whether that's on foam or hair. So, you know, there's a time where, you know, maybe something that dries hard, like a, a UV resin that dries hard, isn't what you're after. Um, and, and there's going to be other times where, uh, you know, you want something that dries hard and rigid. So it just depends what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, that's done. That's done fly right there. When that UV dry or that, that liquid fusion dries you can go fish it. And how, how long do you like to give those just to let the eyes finish or the uh, liquid fusion finish drying? Uh, it should be good in about 30 minutes. I would think. Cool. Yeah, I'll do. I'll let them sit overnight sometimes, but that's just, again, yeah. I don't know if yeah. that's necessary. That's just been my own. But, uh, you know, as long as that is actually dries, you're good. But yeah, if you let it sit overnight, it, it's not going anywhere. It's there to stay. <laughs> Perfect. Well, hey, uh, thank you, Ricky Evans, very much for joining us for this episode of Time with the Pros. Uh, we are getting near the end of this series. Uh, we've got as of now, one more video on the schedule in our deer hair series, um, deciding whether or not we're going to um, add on any more or if we're going to save that for a future season. Uh, but again, uh, really, really cool pattern, tons of utility uh, for bass, pike, um, anything that wants to hit top water. They move in a way in the water that really nothing else does. Uh, so, yeah, Ricky, thank you very much for being here. Thanks for having me. Thank you.